Hi everyone, I'm Alex and joining me is my colleague Phil and we both work for Pentest Partners in the UK and we're going to talk about a couple of in-flight entertainment systems we recently worked on. One really, really ancient and one um, absolutely more recent. Um, both of these were on decommissioned 747s, um, sadly laid up due to the downturn in travelling last year. Um, but I guess the upside from a hacker perspective is that we're able to go and have a good poke at them um, without fear of leaving things in an unserviceable or dangerous state because they were just going to get broken up anyway. Um, just before we continue, I just want to be really clear. This first picture, it's not one of the aircraft we worked on. Um, we're just being a bit careful about um, identifying um, the aircraft that were broken up and, um, and operators just in case they're a bit sensitive. So just to give you a taste of the glamorous life that we lead and an idea of the aircraft vintage, um, these ports and computers and keyboards were absolutely grim. I'm pretty sure they'd never been cleaned in the entire aircraft's history. So um, yeah, this is the kind of thing that you're going to come across if you're scrabbling around a, an aircraft. Tape gloves is the uh, Yeah, tape, tape gloves, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so our first um, system is actually based on lovely old NT4. Um, we found it in what is termed as the, the cupboard under the stairs on, um, on the 747. So this is usually reserved for the cabin crew or the senior cabin crew. And it's kind of like where they hide out during during the flight. So although it is in the cabin, it's, it's still a high traffic part of the aircraft and um, you know, usually crew are going to be around there. So it's not particularly accessible on the slide. Um, this um, particular RFE, the, um, the control unit has a keyboard and a monitor and a rack of uh, media servers <clears throat> for, for content. Um, things like the, the today's news and you know, crappy TV shows that they're, they're going to have. Um, so yeah, as we turned it on, we found it was, it was NT4, um, which totally makes sense because when this aircraft was built in the mid 1990s, NT4 was bleeding edge and, and current. Um, so once it's booted up into its, its normal mode, there, there is actually some semblance of security um, that you know, the, the cabin crew are forced to use. I mean, it's, it's an ID only, there's no username and password. Um, but the six or seven digits, it's still millions of combinations. And realistically, um, you're not going to be able to kind of brute force it just via that console um, in flight in any reasonable time or frankly, without being noticed anyway. Um, but when it booted up, um, we could inter interrupt that through the keyboard and it was really good to see MS-DOS making an appearance under the hood. Um, but actually, if we looked at the build of the the software that was in use, um, you know, although the actual hardware was made in the 1990s, it was still being updated through to 2009 even. So although that might seem a really long time, the you know, these aircraft were designed decades ago, um, and it, it takes a long time to certify and design aircraft and, and all the kit that goes on them. So you would expect to see things with much longer longevity than a kind of a standard computer. And, you know, if you've, you've touched anything in the operational technology world, then this isn't actually too bad. Um, one of the biggest problems that I think we, we were faced, um, which was actually having to remember how to do stuff for NT4. Um, so there was a lot of us, you know, typing things into... Um, into the machine trying to work out you know what, what it was doing and you know we were actually having to get our phones out and google cheat sheets to to do various things whilst we were there so um yeah it's it's one of those things you kind of forget about having how to do things um if we connected onto um some of those really scuzzy network ports that we found at the beginning um, we, we got a DHCP address and we found ourselves on the same network as our good old NT4 box. Um, and yeah, there's, there's IIS right there. Um, and making a new appearance is the NT4 option pack. It's great stuff. Um, so again, we're, we're starting to think this is going to be a complete walkover of, of pwning this box. Um, another thing we found, um, 
on the the console was the you know we could actually write and and upload content to floppy disks so that was really great to see um you know last year i think we showed and it went really viral that um, floppy disks were being used to update their nav db on a 747 and yeah here we are in the other end of the aircraft and floppy disks are being used to export and import content onto these things um so phil tell us how we ended up honing this box yeah so as you said lots of it was googling the archive.org uh internet history came in very helpful for cached pages from the uh, from the mid 90s um, but rather than trying to do all this on the plane at what is quite a steep $250 per hour for the fuel, we decided to build our own lab, um, which in itself was a bit of a challenge to find the right ISOs to get the option pack installed and working. Um, but we thought, you know, be a good lesson. I myself, I was learning how to add up when NT4 was in use. So I'd never really played with it before. So quite a good, good history lesson for all of us. Um, but what we found was we spun up our lab and we were having a play. And uh, a lot of the tools that we use now just don't work. Metasploit doesn't have NT4 modules that work very well. Uh, Mimikat, don't know what else that is. We can't use that. Um, so we really had to go back to how did sysadmins and hackers do this pre-point and shoot effectively. Um, and what we found were there were two main exploits that we found, two of them that both used IIS and both needed the option pack to do it. Uh, so we're quite lucky that the plane was that up to date, even if it's that far behind. Um, the first one was documented by SANS back in the year 2000. Uh, this is a directory traversal. Now, it's quite a nice, simple directory traversal. The only complication with it now is NT4 used UTF-16 rather than the modern UTF-8. So the encoding characters were different. Once you got your head around that and how to do that, it was fine. It was a standard directory traversal that let you get to cmd.exe and then put in a variable as your command. So you could ping back um, NT4 by default has an open FTP. So we were able to put netcat on there, get a connection back and kind of get remote, remote code execution on, a, on an NT4 box, which was really cool. Um, the second one, as so the only problem with that is the with the directory traversal, the operating system and the IIS install has to be on the same drive. So it all has to be on C drive. If IIS followed best practice and was on D drive, it wouldn't work. Now, we don't, we had no idea on the plane how it was configured. So what we really didn't want to do was spend a, another day, another thousand pounds on fuel to find out that they'd followed best practice and installed it on D drive. So we managed to find a second exploit. This again used IIS, but this was using the Microsoft data access components. And effectively, it's the database that sits behind IIS. What were, what happens there is there is the shell command. Uh, so you're able to access that database through IIS and call that shell command. So this worked on any, uh, however it was configured. So if it was on a different drive, this would still work because it was using that core database function. So for us, brilliant. Two ways in, you know, they, the second one is, is guaranteed. So, right, let's uh, work out once we're in, how are we going to get the passwords? How are we going to work out what to do next? Get that persistence. Now, one thing that I wasn't aware of back in the 90s is how critical having the correct DLL in the correct folder was. With Windows 10 and Server 2019, you know, it's, it's pretty clever. It works it all out. But putting PW dump on there without the DLL will give you hours of headaches. Putting the DLL on there, password stump immediately. Um, and then able to, the aim is able to crack those hashes that come out. So we're ready. We're great. Let's book another trip to the yard. Unfortunately, the fact that it was a breaker's yard they also had work to do. And their work sadly involved 
breaking up the plane that we were on. So we organised a visit. We all travelled down there. And the moment we arrived, we got told that plane effectively no longer exists. Here's another one if you want to have a go. So we kind of went onto the plane and it was it was different. It was not old. It was, again, the same age of plane, but they'd recently done an update to the whole IFE system. So this time it was a twin, it was a Bionic Beaver Ubuntu box rather than a T4. So not even in the same family of operating systems. So effectively we had to start again. But because all the IFE had been updated, it meant that there was new vectors and new things that we could look at, which was nice. So they had Wi-Fi on this plane, which is brilliant, with a nice classic who doesn't love a master Wi-Fi switch. Um, and then they were slightly cleaner, I'm happy to say, uh, RJ45 ports that we could use. Now, the Wi-Fi gave us um, access into the IFE, which is great. We could had a bit more comfort, but you still have to be on the plane to access this. And the IFE is still a, it is a closed system. So you can't go completely nuts from your seat. Um, but managed to turn off the Wi-Fi. Might be a bit annoying for some business travellers. Other than that, not too much of an impact. But what it did mean is we had a whole new system to look around. So what we found was quite a few open web applications. Um, a lot of them didn't have much on. Well, there were quite a few with strong passwords that we couldn't get through in the time that we had. However, running things like uh, running password brute forces against them didn't, didn't result in anything. But running a Durbuster, GoBuster, whichever tool you like, managed to find a conf config page and in that config page was s3 bucket details which is crazy to think a plane from the 90s using up-to-date s3 details um was brilliant so we uh had a chat with the vendor and they said okay sure what 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 would you be able to do um so we we logged on it was read write access for the S3 bucket. And what it hosted was all the daily movies and uh, news broadcasts. So as the plane was getting ready to, ready to take off, it would download all the news broadcasts for the day from the S3 bucket. So, you know, what could you do? You could replace the news with something funny. You could delete all the media, that'd be a bit annoying. Um, maybe Peppa Pig rather than the, than the news, who knows? Um, but we spoke spoke to the vendor and they quickly fixed that and uh, have changed it for however many planes that was used on. What there was also, which was really quite fun, was a very tempting number pad. Now we love a good number pad, fixed amount of, of options. What was great about this one, there was no brute force protection. So with no brute force protection, a lot of tools can rapidly go through a lot of numbers and we managed to get access. Now, what was, what was great about that was it gave us access to all of the seat backs. So with one click, you could change every single screen to be the maintenance screen. It looked quite cool, nice bright colours. On a plane where you could see 50 rows, of seats, it looked quite impressive. Again, reputational damage, a little bit annoying if you've just got on a 12 hour flight to Australia. But other than that, you know, no real harm done. Um, the network, we kind of had a sniff around the network and as you'd kind of expect in, this, in these kind of environments, there were plain text protocols. There was, you know, you could sit and you could sniff, but in reality, none of it would really get you that far other than the ability to irritate your passengers i just love this because it's like the cloud in the clouds to me and 
And I think, it, yeah, it's it's reputational damage if if uh, IFE goes down. But an awful lot of airlines give out, you know, frequent flyer miles or some kind of compensation if your IFE doesn't work. And if there was a whole aircraft, then that that could actually add up to to a fair amount of money for for an operator. So, um, yeah, it's not a safety critical thing, but it's yeah, could could be financially um, annoying and maybe wipe out the revenue for that aircraft. Um, you know, we, we found that the, um, the the router that was used for um, SATCOM and for the 4G on the ground had been removed when the aircraft went for uh, for decommissioning. Um, so we couldn't have a poke at those, unfortunately. But they did kindly leave the password behind in the cupboard. Um, that seems quite routine. We, we've often seen passwords written on uh, the sides of bulkheads of aircraft and ships and stuff like that. So, yeah, that, that's that's really common. Um, the IFE seat boxes themselves. Well, here's a delightful view of one of my colleagues trying to get a one. And what what we found was that they they use Doxis, which is the the cable TV protocol that runs to your home probably. Um, and the reason Doxis is used is because it's it's lighter to run a ring between all the seat boxes than it is a traditional hub and spoke Ethernet model. Um, and also, you don't need to manage a switch. Um, obviously, it took us ages to get these out from underneath the seats. It was a really awkward position. Um, it had weird screws. I think a couple of us cut ourselves doing it. It was a right pain. So uh, practically speaking, you know, you're not going to be able to do this um, on a busy flight when there's people's, you know, feet and rows all, all crowded. So, um, you know, all these do is is play videos basically so there's not a lot of of interesting stuff um we did open them up to have have a look um but again inside there's not that much interesting stuff on there apart from um the ssds at the bottom there um the, where they the the um media for for this particular vendor um is stored on all of the seat boxes rather than being a central media server so it's kind of sharded out um, which is kind of interesting and again kind of saves weight and um, and gear on board um yeah again g- getting access to this stuff is you're going to get you spotted i think it, it um, definitely didn't go back in either yeah, yeah it was really difficult <laughs> to put back together yeah um so i mean the only other um portion of this um was um, a module a line replaceable unit down in the avionics bay um and this is used for generating the the moving map um, everyone likes to see where they are and, and how long they've got left. Are we nearly there yet? Kind of attitude. So, um, again, there was an RJ45 port on the front. It dropped you onto the same network. Does it really count? I mean, not really. I mean, if you saw um, my walkthrough of the 747 last year, you'll know that there is actually access to the avionics bay um, from the cabin of a 747. Um, but again, you're going to get spotted really quickly. It's noisy. It's horrible. I wouldn't want to be in there and fly. Um, again, it's not going to get you anything you couldn't get anywhere else anyway. Um, so yeah, it's practically speaking, it's it's pretty difficult. Now, both of these airframes are are retired now, um, and I think it's important to remember that when you are working on um, research in these kinds of areas, that just because it's old doesn't necessarily mean that it's not in use somewhere else. Um, in the world our our most recently up-to-date one is definitely um, still in use and we've spoken with both of the IFE vendors involved here Um, they were really responsive they addressed the current issues where they they needed to and it had the potential to impact um, current operations Um, they they were quite happy for us to to talk through um, these issues and and publish Um, again I just want to reinforce that there is strong segregation between what is called a passenger domain and the control domain. So you can't just connect to the network port um, for the IFE and suddenly be able to control the airplane. Um, So although we might be able to play our own videos and maybe brick the IFE, there's no real safety impact from from these kinds of systems. But if you are researching these, then you really absolutely need to um, be careful um, how you present and, and discuss these issues um, you know, media outlets are certainly going to jump on um, reports like this if they're not handled in, in the right way. So definitely worth bearing in mind if you're researching these issues. 
Uh, really to sum up then, um, definitely really interesting things we found, you know, pretty much with, with most walks of operational technology, there's going to be outdated components, clear text protocols, lots of old hardware, things you can plug into, um, but you really shouldn't um, unless you are researching a decommissioned um, aircraft. I think it's important, again, to say that these older systems probably don't reflect the current state of new IFE particularly. Um, and, of course, don't forget, we've we've got a fair number of physical security controls. Um, these aircraft are always going to be um, airsides behind security um, at airports. You're never going to be kind of allowed to run riot on one on your own. There's all going to be crew and other people around um, who are trying to look out for kind of people tinkering with things with screwdrivers. So, um, yeah, it's, it's fun nonetheless, but practically speaking, um, yeah, that's, there's not much you can do with them. Um, more, moreover than anything, it was a great down um, sort of memory lane on the NT forefront, and having to you know, kind of relearn how we did stuff twenty years ago. So yeah. that's what my takeaway was. Well, you say relearn, I say learn for the first time. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I remember NT four; it was bleeding edge. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, um, and thank you, Phil, for talking us through some of these great things. No problem. Thanks, Alex. Cheers.